Well, hello everybody. I hope you've had a really good start to the conference. Welcome to this final panel for today at the RLI fifth annual conference. And this session is our first keynote speaker session. For those who weren't in the opening session, my name is Professor David Cantor. I'm the director of the RLI. And for our opening keynote this year, I'm truly delighted to welcome James Hathaway, the James and Sarah Deegan Professor of Law at the University of Michigan. Professor Hathaway certainly needs no introduction in a conference on refugee law. He's the leading authority today on the Refugee Convention, and his publications on refugee law include more than 100 journal articles, book chapters and studies, including, of course, the groundbreaking Law of Refugee Status and the Rights of Refugees Under International Law. A fuller biography for Professor Hathaway will appear in the chat box in a moment, but just to note that a new edition of the Rights of Refugees has just been published, and I'd highly recommend a copy if you're interested in that area of law. The title of this year's conference is Aging Gracefully, the 1951 Convention at 70 Years. And the title of Professor Hathaway's keynote presentation responds directly to this by playfully asking, is aging gracefully an ageist critique? I know that we're all really looking forward with great anticipation to hear what Professor Hathaway has to say under this title. In terms of the procedure, the plenary is going to uh, advance with the keynote presentation of half an hour or less, after which Professor Hathaway has kindly agreed to respond to selected questions and comments from other conference participants. So during the session, please do pose your own questions and comments to him by typing them into the chat box on Zoom. And after his presentation, I'll uh, try and select one by one a number of questions, as many as possible, to present to him um, once we reach the time for discussion. The session is being recorded and will be posted on the RLI website as a podcast. So if you don't wish to appear in the podcast, then please leave the session now. On that note, Professor Hathaway, we're delighted to receive you as our opening keynote at this year's conference, and you have the floor. Well, good morning. Uh, and I will say good morning because it is very early morning here in Vancouver. Uh, good morning to those of you in Latin America and the East Coast of North America. Good afternoon in Europe uh, and in Africa. South Asia, I guess you're still early evening. And for anyone who's in Oceania or uh, East Asia, all you have are my commiserations. Uh, one of the downsides of the Zoom world, of course, is that we all end up doing things at strange hours. Uh, and for those of you who are, uh, thank you so much for your kindness in uh, staying awake in order to participate. I do want to thank David and his colleagues for organizing this, not just in the usual, you know, sort of, we all thank conference organizers way, but honestly, at this moment in history to put something together on this scale uh, when we are not able actually to meet is, is pretty wonderful. Uh, and I'm grateful to you uh, and your colleagues for having done that, David. Uh, last uh, but not least, let me simply say uh, that, you know, I am trying to be playful with your topic. Uh, we'll start with this, is the notion of aging gracefully uh, uh, something we can play with. And I, and I think I'm old enough that I can play with it. And so let, 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 me, let me give you my, my sense of a reaction to this. When I first looked at the title uh, of the conference, I will say it did kind of strike me, the aging gracefully thing. And maybe it is because I'm getting on in years. I looked at it and I thought, I'm not sure if that's a compliment or not. Uh, it doesn't actually feel like one. Aging gracefully sounds like, you know, one of those fist in a velvet glove kind of ideas. So I went to the great Google Oracle uh, to see what it actually means. And it typically means something kind of like this jaunty older gentleman. Uh, the great Google Oracle says aging gracefully means showing signs of aging but still powering forward with life, looking old, but embracing it. So a bit like this gentleman, keeping up appearances to be sure, but sort of hobbling where he once might have been moving forward with confidence. So the question then is, is this an apt metaphor uh, 
for the 1951 Refugee Convention. And I think there are at least two ways in which it can be said that the Refugee Convention is hobbling. Uh, and I want to focus on these first before I offer my defense of the convention. The first way in which I think it is hobbling is that it is the only major UN human rights treaty today that lacks an independent supervisory body. Even the old 1948 genocide convention, uh, the one treaty that preceded in human rights law, the refugee convention now has the International Criminal Court. We have nothing, we are the orphan child. The second, and I think even more critical way in which the Refugee Convention is hobbling is that we still lack a dependable system to share burdens and responsibilities. So let me speak briefly to this first point. Again, it is an historical anomaly that we don't have an independent supervisory body like every other UN Human Rights Treaty. It hadn't been thought of in 1951. But as I said, the Genocide Convention has updated that with the ICC. And so we are now the one entity left behind with no body empowered to pronounce on the meaning of the convention, much less to adjudicate compliance or breach with those duties. And I think that is a big problem. There are, of course, some wishful thinkers who would argue that the uh, supervising of compliance job belongs to UNHCR. But I think on a careful reading of both the UNHCR statute and Article 35 of the convention, it is clear that that is not so. Neither uses the straightforward obvious language of supervising the refugee convention. Both the Article 35 and uh, Article 8F of the agency statute speak about supervising the application of the convention, a rather odd turn of phrase, if what you thought the entity was entitled to do was to actually oversee the convention as a whole. But in truth, if you drill down into the statute, for example, Article 8F, you see that what the agency was intended to do was to, for example, monitor states implementation by obtaining information about the laws and regulations concerning refugees, something that sounds a lot like supervising the implementation of the Refugee Convention. And while the agency does issue lots of interpretive paper, senior courts have, I think, been fairly clear that it does not have the right to actually adjudicate compliance or breach with the treaty. And so, for example, we see in this quote from the Constitutional Court of South Africa, the handbook is a guideline. It's persuasive, but it can be overridden. The Americans, not surprisingly, it's a useful interpretive aid, it's not binding, and maybe domestic law is more helpful. Even the English Court of Appeal, the UNHCR is a significant voice, but it's not a lawgiver, it's not a source of law. And I think these are all, as a matter of treaty interpretation, quite correct. This is not to say that we ought not to pay attention to what UNHCR has to say, both by virtue of its institutional position and its experience, but it does not have the ability, as do the treaty supervisory bodies for the other UN human rights conventions, does not have the ability to say, this is the correct interpretation and this is an example of breach. We lack that at present. And can we speak frankly, uh, as Jeff Crisp uh, typically does? I think we were all probably quite heartened this last week to see the refugee agency speak so clearly about externalization, particularly in the context of the proposed Danish policy. But part of the reason we were all so happy to see that, quite frankly, was because it was so unusual. It is incredibly rare for the agency to actually supervise the refugee convention in the sense that I'm describing it, defining compliance and defining breach. More typical is the situation that Jeff is referring to in the tweet on the screen. The issue of deaths at sea occasioned by European Union member states, easily visible to all of us, in response to which UNHCR says that it is saddened. Saddened. Well, 
That's not supervising the refugee convention. In my view, the actual best role for UNHCR is to develop its supervising the implementation of the convention honest role. Uh, and that has actually been done, I think, quite beautifully in the last decade or so by the agency's interventions more frequently in domestic and regional court proceedings that really show UNHCR at its protection best. This, in my view, is a smart and valuable supervising the application role for UNHCR, helping countries to get it right without pretending that it has the power to require any particular result. So my advice is that UNHCR should embrace this role, but since it cannot, of course, simultaneously be both advocate and judge, the agency should stop putting roadblocks in the way of a more full-blooded enforcement system of the kind that every other major UN human rights treaty benefits from. At the very, very least, we need what the Cambridge, Michigan project proposed a decade ago, namely a global advisory opinion mechanism capable of renovating through interpretation, both the rights regime and in particular the refugee definition. Just as even the finest car needs to be regularly tuned up, so too does the refugee convention. And that is a job that is not presently being done in an authoritative way. Even if we can get past that first hurdle, by far the biggest hurdle is the failure to establish a global system dependably to share burdens, and by burdens, I mean money, and responsibilities, I mean people. Uh, I can't resist the opportunity to make it clear that I think the European Union's approach of treating the two of burdens and responsibilities as one is ethically suspect and something we ought not to follow. People are people, and burdens are burdens, and ne'er the twain shall meet, in my view. The point, though, is that the drafters of the Refugee Convention, right from the get-go, knew that we needed a mechanism to share burdens and responsibilities. If you look at this, right in the preamble, they acknowledged that the fact that accidents of geography determine presumptive primary responsibility for protection would put heavy burdens on certain countries, namely those closer to regions of origin, and that we weren't going to fix the problem until we actually had a system that responded through international cooperation. And by that, I do not mean blah, 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 we'll try to help you. I mean real guarantees of protection so that countries will in fact keep their doors open, knowing that doing so doesn't expose them to unlimited and indefinite responsibilities. But what is the reality 70 years after the drafting of the Refugee Convention? We've got somewhere between 12 and 14 million refugees, two thirds of the total number of refugees in the world who have been waiting an average of two decades for a durable solution with none in sight. Two thirds of the world's refugees in protracted refugee situations. Of these, fewer than 1% are resettled in any given year. In the result, what we've ended up with is just 10, mostly quite poor countries, now hosting more than 60% of the world's refugees with the entire developed world, all the rich countries of the world put together, taking only 15% of the refugees in need of asylum. That is not remotely close to what the drafters of the Refugee Convention intended. And yet those same rich countries that only take 15% of the world's refugees spend at least 20 billion, with a B, 20 billion US dollars every year to fund their refugee reception efforts. That amount for 15% of the world's refugees is more than four times what the UN Refugee Agency has available to meet the needs of the 85% of refugees in poor countries. So the result is a protection regime that in my view is risky, chaotic, debilitating, with resources misallocated relative to needs and which does not provide durable solutions for most refugees. 
So what is the answer then? Well, the answer we've been given to this challenge of unfair sharing of burdens and responsibilities is the Global Compact on, and by the way, I wanna make sure we're getting the name right, the Global Compact on, not for refugees, the Global Compact on Refugees. Under the compact and its comprehensive refugee response framework, if a particular crisis is deemed big enough, I don't know what a large movement is, is it 1,000, 10,000, 100,000? But if it is, then we agree that certain principles, including burden sharing, will quote, normally, normally govern an effort to find a solution. Nothing guaranteed. In the interim, what we get is lots and lots and lots of chatter. We get global refugee summits, we get steering groups, we get solidarity conferences, we get a global support platform, we get host country consultative mechanisms, we get regional consultative mechanisms, and lest anybody think that academics aren't going to be brought into the co-optation gravy train, yes, we get a global academic network. We get, in other words, unending conversations, blah, 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 even though a model for how to actually do burden and responsibility sharing has been on the table for more than a quarter century. We don't need to talk, 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 we need to do. And the Global Compact does not do that. So I don't wanna pull my punches. I mean, I, I, I know I tend to understate my critiques uh, as you would expect. I think we do have problems. Refugee protection is in trouble. So to refer to the aging metaphor for our meeting, it is sort of hobbling along. But the critical point, and this is the one takeaway I would ask you to retain from this talk, is that it is the protection system, not the refugee convention. It is the protection system in both the supervisory and the sharing respects that is the nub of the problem. There is absolutely no need whatever to amend the treaty in order to fix both of these very real problems. There is in fact a need actually to implement the Refugee Convention. So let me very quickly explain why it is I believe we need to renovate the structures of protection rather than going for a new refugee treaty. The first and the most obvious reason, and yes, this is a pragmatic point, is that we already have three quarters of the world's governments formally on board. I wish we had them all. I wish UNHCR were more aggressively pursuing ratification, but three quarters isn't bad. And remember, once a state has ratified the convention, it cannot enter any new reservations or declarations to it. So we've got them inside the normative tent, which is a big deal. Does anybody seriously believe that if we opened a new refugee convention today, we would get three quarters of the world's governments on board? And I think the short answer is there's not a chance. So the mere fact of normative consensus in binding law is huge in my view. The second point is that it's a pretty smart treaty. In the right hands, and now we come back to the supervision point, but in the right hands, the refugee definition can be and has evolved in ways that ensure its continuing relevance. So for example, some 20 years ago, the House of Lords adopted the living treaty notion for refugee law, adopted for a humanitarian end, and I love this phrase, constant in motive but mutable in form. That is precisely the spirit in which we should approach this treaty. Similarly, the High Court of Australia made clear that this is not a Eurocentric treaty. You cannot interpret, for example, persecution just in the way that it was known at World War II. In different cultures, different societies, different norms, it's not static, it's not fixed by history. And think about where we have come over the last 25 years. 
25 years ago, nobody would have imagined that at-risk women and queer people would be protected as refugees. Today, we know they can be. No one would have imagined that war, refugee, war refugees would qualify as convention refugees. They now clearly can. Nobody would have imagined that discriminatory impact is as much a gateway to nexus as discriminatory intent. But now we know that it is. Nobody would have imagined that grave economic harms can amount to persecution. But we now know that they can. All of these things have come to pass because of excellent advocacy and clear-headed judicial thinking that has enabled us to actually do what both the House of Lords and the Australian High Court suggest in this screen we ought reasonably to be doing. And yes, even on issues like the so-called climate change refugees, the New Zealand Court of Appeal has made clear in Tetiata that some will qualify as convention refugees, and the UN Human Rights Committee has complemented that by saying that a broader class will be entitled to protection against return under that treaty. The point is not that the refugee definition is perfect, but it is not half bad. It is, in my view, quite serviceable, especially when it's read together with the companion human rights treaties, as I think it must be, given the rules of the Vienna Convention. At least important as the definition are the rights that are in the Refugee Convention. And I apologize to those of you who've heard me say this before, but I am not going to miss the opportunity to say it again. It never ceases to astound me how many people jump from the Article 1 definition to Article 33 non refoulement law, and they forget that there's 30 some odd articles in between. That is the core of the convention. Quite frankly, non refoulement law was an afterthought. It was not the primary goal of the treaty. The primary goal of the treaty was to actually enable refugees to get on with their lives in ways that are still actually quite unique, despite the fact that international human rights law has come along in the interim. And so, for example, not just non refoulement but things like the inability to legally to penalize refugees for arriving without permission, access to travel documents, access to identity documents, all of these things exist nowhere else. And at least as important, and I think this is actually the core of the Refugee Convention, are the economic rights in the Refugee Convention that go significantly beyond what international human rights law provides for and which are not subject to the various constraints that generic socioeconomic rights are subject to. At least as important, all of these rights follow automatically from the fact of being a refugee. It is not the case that you only get these rights once some country determines you to be a refugee. As the UNHCR has said in the handbook from the beginning, as the qualification directive now codifies, as the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has clearly stated, as the Supreme Court of Canada has affirmed, refugee status follows from facts, not from formalities. That is astounding that we start with a presumption of inclusion until and unless an individual is proved not to be a refugee. We would never get that again under a new treaty. And yet that extraordinary strength of the convention from the optic of refugees is in my view, smartly and neatly balanced against an approach that ensures fairness to the states that receive refugees. And I know some of you will not be comfortable with me saying this, but, but I do think it's important as human rights lawyers that we be attentive both to the needs of refugees and to the needs of the states where they go. Because if we're not, the system will break down and no one will get protected. The Refugee Convention does this in a way that no other international human rights treaty does. It is, in my view, super smart. So as the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom has acknowledged, the rights arise over five levels of attachment. Some rights critically arise as soon as a state takes jurisdiction over a refugee, even on the high seas. Some rights as soon as the refugee touches the territorial sea or the land mass of the state in question, 
other rights as soon as it has claimed the refugee has claimed protection in whatever way the host state has established. Those first three levels of attachment, in other words, provide for series of rights that are not contingent on adjudication of status. Only the latter two levels of attachment are predicated upon a finding of entitlement to refugee status. So what I want you to see is that, look at this, even before we have a decision on refugee status, the three sets of rights that you now see on the screen are all under this refugee convention owed until and unless a negative refugee assessment is rendered are all owed to the refugee. Only these two categories at the bottom can be withheld pending the assessment of status. So the majority of rights in this convention are available to the refugee to enable him or her to survive while a decision is being considered. Yet states can withhold certain rights that are closer to the bone of what they believe to be their sovereign project until the individual has been allowed to stay. I think that balancing of what the refugee needs immediately with what the state might legitimately be concerned about instant sharing is very smart. To ask for everything immediately is to risk complete failure and doors slamming. Equally important, this is my second point, the convention provides for a very smart mix of absolute and contingent rights. Yes, some rights are provided absolutely, but most rights are actually granted at the level that the state owes them to somebody else, either its own citizens or most favored foreigners. For example, EU citizens in the European Union, ECOWAS citizens in West Africa, Mercosur citizens in relevant parts of Latin America. And again, look at this, only a tiny number of rights at the very bottom are provided to refugees only at the same level provided to aliens generally. Almost all rights in this convention accrue to refugees at a level more favorable than the fallback position in general international human rights law. That is huge. That is huge. And yet at the same time, it only asks you to do what you're already doing for somebody else, making it fair for states. The third point I want to mention this morning, and this becomes increasingly important as refugees find themselves fleeing from difficult countries to other difficult countries, is that even when we're not talking about the incredible socioeconomic rights packages of the convention where international human rights law cannot even begin to compete, even if we're talking about civil and political rights where general human rights are in many ways more valuable, one of the unique contributions of the refugee convention is that to the extent those civil and political rights are protected, they cannot like rights in the civil and political covenant or the European Convention, for example, be suspended in an emergency situation. Under the Refugee Convention, the cognate rights can only be suspended until verification of refugee status. Once the individual has been found to be a refugee, there can be no national security, time of war limitations on refugee rights. They are owed at that point without a clawback. That is also huge. So to sum up then, my, my point is not that all is well in the refugee law world, far from it. But I will say that I think it is wrong to lampoon the refugee convention as showing signs of age gracefully or otherwise. To the contrary, I think it's way past time for us to complete the refugee convention based regime with the two pillars that I've described. A serious supervisory system capable of defining the nature of obligations and identifying breaches thereof. And secondly, and in particular, not pretty words on a paper, not lots of conferences, not lots of we'll come to your aid if we can stuff, but a binding and dependable system 
to share the burdens and responsibilities of refugee protection around the world. The content, on the other hand, of the Refugee Convention, a flexible definition, and an incredibly smart catalog of often quite unique rights is, in my view, despite being 70 years old, well, not so much like the old man in the screen, but a little more like this woman. Absolutely, fabulously, in your face, sassy, and more than capable of handling the challenges of today as much as those of earlier times. So my plea to you this morning is support her, encourage her, work with her, but don't abandon her. Thanks so much for your time, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thanks ever so much, Professor Hathaway, for your absolutely fantastic uh, opening keynote speech. And I think the image that you've left with us will stay with many of us for, for years as an image of the convention personified. Very striking. I'm very glad that the title that we've chosen has provoked such a strong response from you and really a tour de force um, of what the convention is, what it has been, and potentially where it's going next as well. So for this part of the session, we have about a half an hour left, and already various comments and questions have started flooding in from those who've been listening over the course of the last half hour to what you've been saying. Um, I'm going to select those questions and uh, read out as many as I can, although you've requested that I do this one by one and that your responses will be relatively concise to them. So one thing I should say is that quite a number of the points that you raised touch on issues that were discussed in a very early panel this afternoon called Injecting New Life into International Refugee Law. And it looks like a number of the questions and comments tie up some of the themes that were discussed there also. So for the very first question, Professor Hathaway, we have, um, is it possible without amending the 1951 convention to make it attractive to states that have resisted accession, sometimes energetically resisted? After all, those non-signatories host a good share of the world's refugee population. And that's from Jean-Francois Dorier. So over to you, Professor Hathaway. Yeah, a, a, a typically piercing uh, question from uh, Jean-Francois. And by the way, I apologize that the time difference meant that I wasn't able to get up at four in the morning uh, coherently and to hear those earlier interventions. And I, and I do apologize for that. Look, I, I think that the two points that I've made may have slightly different trajectories for evolution. I think, and, and, and this was the Cambridge, Michigan project which we had senior judges from around the world involved. Volker Turk participated. The former Chief Justice of the United Kingdom was one of the judges. We had consensus on a supervisory mechanism that could be put in place tomorrow, presumably perhaps with XCOM approval, but not requiring any amendment of the treaty. And that model is still sitting on the table and could be implemented now. Burden and responsibility sharing, my own sense, is that that is a project that probably requires an optional protocol to begin uh, when a significant number of states are on board, we hopefully will expand it in a way that will make it attractive. If I were these non-signatory states, I would not be comfortable coming in until the latter was in place. I'll be honest with you. Uh, if I had a frontier on a conflict-ridden country, where I was exposed to risk and I had no guarantees of support from the rest of the world, I would not be surprised to see non-accession remaining the norm. And that's why we have to fix this. Well, fantastic. On that um, same point, you've got a closely related question which asks, um, why is hosting refugees considered as a burden in the discussions? and even in the laws. Is it possible to transform the way of managing refugees to be an opportunity? And this is a question from Mulu Alem Jakob Ayalu. Yeah, and, and I, I wanna be clear, you know, this goes back to the dichotomy I mentioned at the beginning. I do not view hosting refugees as a burden. I view hosting refugees as a responsibility. I view the actual costs of receiving, processing, and enabling refugees 
to be costs and hence burdens, which we all ought logically to share with the states doing the disproportionate share of that work. So yes, you know, I, I mean, I have written about this at great length, you know, following the work of Alex Betts and others, there is no doubt that refugees can be huge sources of empowerment for local populations. States have proved this time and time again. I'm not arguing to the contrary. But my point is, if you're a country sitting in a place, I mean, imagine, you know, Tanzania a couple of decades ago receiving a million and a half people in 36 hours. I mean, can you even contemplate what that looks like, right? And then you have a country like Australia that gets 300 and thinks it's a national crisis. So my, my point is that I do think it is unreasonable, even if refugees can in time provide opportunities for host states, I do think it is reasonable to say, the rest of us stand in solidarity with you when you open your doors to this group. Not only will the costs that you bear be shared out with the rest of us, but ultimately if refugees can't go home and they can't be locally integrated over time, we will mandatorily offer resettlement to them because accidents of geography should not determine where refugees are protected. That's my simple point. Well, many thanks. Um, the next question uh, takes us back to the issue of supervisory responsibility and asks, it's, it's a longish and very contextualized question, but in essence it asks, if Professor Hathaway argues UNHCR has no mandate to interpret the Refugee Convention, then we have a hole. Unless and until there's some treaty monitoring mechanism, what can and should fill it? And this is from uh, Hugo's story. So I don't think we have a hole. Uh, and in fact, Judge Story knows quite well that we don't have a hole because the transnational judicial conversation has in many ways filled that void, right? I mean, the entirety of our book, The Law of Refugee Status, shows that the judges of the world have in fact responded to that interpretive void by speaking to each other. That's the critical point, by actually learning from each other and trying to come up with a normative consensus. The problem, of course, is it can't be made binding. So, you know, that's why I believe the Cambridge, Michigan model needs to be resuscitated. Can it be done, uh, you know, in ways that are more modest than that? Sure. And part of it is, you know, there's a big difference between the agency putting out lots of paper and, for example, resolutions of the executive committee, which is a matter of international law, are part of the context of the Refugee Convention and hence mandatorily taken into account in its interpretation. They are the least bad mechanism we presently have of generating the consensus of state parties as to the meaning of the treaty. So I mean, there is that two-pronged interim place, the transnational judicial conversation and the executive committee that could provide what is required. But again, the reason I'm suggesting they're not enough is because I think they're not enough. I think the idea of moving in the direction that all other UN human rights treaties have gone is long overdue. And I want UNHCR to do its job of protecting refugees on the ground. I want UNHCR to do its job of standing in front of courts and negotiating with governments. But I don't think those jobs are reconcilable to being an independent, neutral, expert oversight body for the meaning of the treaty. Thank you very much. Um, the questions are coming thick and fast. We'll try and get through as many yeah. of them as we can. And thanks for the, the quick fire responses. Um, so I have a question here, which takes us back to questions of responsibility sharing. What role, Professor Hathaway, do you see for soft law and the accompanying incorporation of diverse stakeholders' perspectives, for example, by way of the universal um, compact uh, of the compact on refugees? What role do you see that playing as we consider responsibility sharing moving forward? In other words, is there some kind of role for soft law, do you think? I'm dying to know who put that question. You have to tell me, David. Apologies. Um, Asma Rah uh, Rahimia uh, okay. was the person putting forward. Thank, thank you, Asma. Uh, and, and there's no reason you should know this. Uh, and I'm now going to alienate half the room I appreciate, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, the surest way to fail a course with me is to invoke soft law. Uh, I think it is a terrible idea 
soft law to me is a little bit like being half pregnant. It doesn't exist. It's either law in that it meets the rules of recognition that bind states, or it's a political project. And we shouldn't call it law because all we then do is confuse the minds of the judges and others who might be willing to apply real law to real cases because it's all muddled up in a sea of verbiage which has not reflect the consensus or much less the agreement of states. So I never use the term soft law. You will fail the course with me if you ever use it because it doesn't exist. There's law and there are political projects. The Global Compact is an admirable political project. It is 25 years late. Uh, a lot of the rest of us were doing this a quarter century ago, but better late than never, perhaps. Uh, but it is not law. And will it generate law? To be frank, I doubt it. I think states are moving in the opposite direction. They quite love waddling around in this murky territory of soft law because they know that it makes them sound like they're doing something responsive to law, and yet because it's soft, they don't actually have to do it. Uh, I think we are creating a disaster zone for human rights lawyering generally, and for refugee law in particular, by playing into this silly notion of soft law. What we should recognize is that when something is law, we intend it to be taken seriously by the states per Vienna Convention norms. We intend judges to apply it in accordance with their national legal systems, we expect regional courts to apply it as the inter-American and European courts in particular have done. And while it is in evolution, a little bit like, you know, I, I probably shouldn't use, like the global compact is the Tinder date of, of you know, refugee law. It's a date. Maybe, may, maybe somebody will end up pregnant someday, but they're not. It's not law yet. And, and, and I just don't think there is any value at all in muddling those two up because what we end up with is normative confusion and refugees unprotected. Many thanks. Well, there you have the uh, black letter lawyer's view. Um, next question is also around the issue of burden and responsibility sharing and acknowledging that burden and responsibility sharing is often community driven and some of the best de facto supervision and advocacy is from the ground up, how can and or does international refugee law provide additional support to those important society-driven dynamics in today's challenging world? That's a question from Brian Gorlick. Yeah, I, I, think, it's, I think it's a critical discursive tool, right? I mean, and Brian knows this from his work better than anyone. When civil society engages from an optic of relative strength, namely from a duty that a state has signed on to itself, its ability to meaningfully influence the behavior of states is significantly better than if it's simply opting, uh, operating from the perspective of desirable outcomes. And, and so I do think it's important, again, to acknowledge in those conversations that there are some things that are good ideas. There are some things that are part of agreed political projects like the Global Compact. And there are some things that are actually binding law like the Convention and the Covenants. And each of those has variable intensity in terms of its utility in the discursive process of bringing states on board, even when you are civil society rather than a judge sitting behind a lectern. Fantastic. So um, another question about advocacy, which is um, you mentioned one of the factors contributing to the endurance of the convention is excellent advocacy on behalf of refugees under the convention. In your opinion, what contributes to and detracts from effective advocacy on behalf of refugees and what specific strategies should advocates pursue or avoid? So two questions in one from uh, Steve Maley. That's a really great question. Uh, and, and I wish I had the perfect answer to that. Uh, and, I, and I've looked back at cases that appeared difficult, but which ultimately succeeded uh, in many contexts. And I think the one critical point is unflinching integrity and honesty in putting the law to the court. Do not overstate the law. 
do not pretend that something that is simply desirable is binding. What you do then is you lose the confidence of the bench very quickly. And, and so my advice to lawyers has always been that one needs to take law quite seriously. If you are playing a lawyerly role, as opposed to, for example, the role that Brian Garlick was talking about, civil society advocacy and strategizing, if you're actually playing a lawyerly role, I think we have an ethical responsibility to be unflinchingly honest, not to bullshit, if I can put it quite simply, about what the law is. And so my approach is always to encourage young lawyers arguing difficult cases to clearly indicate to a court what is presently binding and distinguish that from what they believe to be a desirable outcome as opposed to what they simply wish were true. They are not the same things. And we muddle them, we end up with judges making bad decisions. So, you know, but the critical thing for lawyers, I mean, in so much of the world, and this sounds really trite, is, is in so much of the world, we don't even get access to refugee claimants. In so many parts of the world, there are no lawyers with the training, the time, or the funding to actually work with refugees, right? So, so you know, I mean, I start from the ethereal, how do we advocate for refugees down to the basic bones, which is a lot of these issues are not being raised simply because there is no one with the training to be able to do so. This is where I come back to my, my origins in poverty law. We need to be focusing on community advocates, not just formally trained lawyers. We need to be educating people at the coalface about the Refugee Convention. I spent part of last week working with 150 uh, non-lawyers from around the world, trying to get them primed to the point that they could actually make plausible legal arguments, knowing that there are no lawyers in the places they're working able to come to that age. So, so we, we've got a lot of challenges, Steve, as you know from your work. But, but I think you know, those are two thoughts that I would offer. Um, one of the challenges, uh, says this intervener, to your point about the content of rights being contingent on the level of protection that st such states provide others in their territory, is that yep. the concern of leveling down? How does that then affect the plausibility of responsibility sharing between countries which have very different standards of protection? And this is a question from Ruvi Ziegler. So if what you're saying is that, uh, for example, uh, a right that has to be uh, honored at the level of national treatment could be different, differently conceived in country A from country B, uh, I, I, and I take that as your point. And so, for, for example, there was a, if I may say, uh, a very mistaken uh, English case some years ago uh, that said that uh, the idea behind the internal protection alternative as we had conceived it was that you had to get as many rights in a regional country in Africa as you would in the United Kingdom. And, 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 and that clearly is not true. That's not what the Refugee Convention says. It requires states to live up to what they are able to do for others. And clearly some states have more capacity in that regard than do others. So would it enable us to effectively responsibility share is Ruby's question as I understand it. And again, I think that goes down to what we mean by responsibility sharing. Uh, the model that I've argued for does not, for example, involve refugees being shipped out of developed countries where they've made asylum claims to go back to the region of origin. I, I, I just think that's silly. I think responsibility sharing needs to be conceived in different ways at different stages. The first country of arrival obligation ought to be true for everyone. I view most responsibility sharing in the early years of protection as sensibly done in the regions of origin because it facilitates efforts at repatriation uh, it enables people to get cultural and functional compatibility issues addressed more quickly. But I believe the responsibility of states outside the regions of origin uh, ought to take the form predominantly of special needs resettlement and residual resettlement for those refugees who can't go home within roughly five years. Uh, and in the model that I've put forward, I've suggested, you know, the developed world is 
processing around 1.7 million asylum claims a year. If we were instead resettling 1.7 million refugees a year, uh, we could end the protracted refugee problem uh, in a couple of decades. And that's what I would prefer to see. So it's, it's, it's a very complex question I've written about at length and I can't do justice to in a quick response to your, your question, Ruby. But I think the short answer is that the divergent standards in the convention are actually helpful to us, but they're not going to be the basis upon which we remove people from the first world to less developed countries. And that shouldn't be happening anyway. Many thanks. Um, a point here which builds on this question of uh, country of first asylum. Do you think that the drafters of the Refugee Convention foresaw states attempting to absolve themselves of their obligations towards refugees through externalization measures? And do you think the convention can respond to this problem? This is from uh, Maya Grundler who chaired a panel earlier today on externalization. I think there is a 0% chance that the drafters thought this would be acceptable or indeed even that it would happen. I mean, one of the drafters, Professor Henkin, the American drafter, in response to what the United States was doing uh, on, in the Caribbean in response to uh, Haitian asylum seekers said when he was still alive, that this was absolutely the opposite of what the drafters had intended. And I'm sure that is right. There's no mention of it. Now I've argued that there are protection elsewhere rules. And I think that is the right frame. That is what we ought to call it. That governs so-called things like first country of arrival, first country of asylum, all that stuff. States are entitled lawfully prior, prior, and this is critical, to a refugee establishing lawful presence, that means before we admit him or her to an asylum procedure, to share responsibility to protect with other state parties, not with non-state parties who have no obligations, on the assumption that that other state actually de facto, not that they promise, but that they really do it, per the High Court of Australia, that they really deliver all of the convention rights when due on the terms mandated by the Refugee Convention. Now, if we could reframe the conversation in that way, and this in a way responds to some of Ruby's a question as well, if we could reframe the conversation this way, then we actually have responsibility sharing rather than dumping. So there is no chance that the drafters ever imagined that the European Union would be sending out ships onto the Mediterranean to pick up people seeking protection and dump them into torture chambers in Libya. Zero percent chance that that was intended. And I must say, and this goes back to the comment that I put up from Jeff Crisp uh, on his tweet earlier, I am disappointed, really disappointed, that the UNHCR has not been able to say clearly without a tiny bit of equivocation that EU funding of those efforts amounts to aiding and assisting a breach of international law. It does, period. That kind of stuff has to end. So what is now being called externalization, I think should just stop. It's just wrong. I would have a one sentence guideline on this. Don't do it. If what you want instead is meaningful responsibility sharing predicated on respect for the convention, then I think we can have a conversation. But that's not what's on the table right now. Many thanks. Um, I'm just going to very quickly take advantage of the moderator role and insert my own question here, which is you've identified these kind of the two areas where perhaps the convention could be doing better, if you like. Uh, what do you see the main obstacles being to achieving better supervision and better responsibility and burden sharing. And what do you think the main ways are of addressing those pragmatically? Oh, David, that's such a cruel way to end, uh, but it's pointed and it's accurate, right? I get it. Uh, on the first, I think the first point on supervision is more easily resolvable than the second. In, in each case, political will, just give it two words, is, is, is the biggest challenge. But on the former, the supervision, we also have a problem, quite frankly, in that UNHCR has put up roadblocks to evolution on that front. And that needs to stop now. And then we can have a serious conversation about how meaningfully to supervise the convention once the agency doesn't seek to protect its own institutional turf in a way that I think is not helpful to the ultimate cause of refugees, nor indeed 
to its ability to function as a nimble agency in difficult situations where compromises need to be made. I think UNHCR needs to realize that having a supervisory body is actually in its interest because it frees it up to do the difficult work on the ground that may require compromise in a way that an independent supervisory body ought not to be engaged in. But on both points, I think the political will challenge is huge. And so what I've tried to do uh, is to explain why it is that, for example, responsibility and burden sharing actually work well for everybody. If states actually understand how we could retool the mechanism of protection in a way that is dependable, in a way that is not subject to security risk, in a way that is economically viable, that delivers better outcomes for refugees. If you could in short show states, and I quite frankly believe that you know, the reformulation project did that a quarter century ago, and more recent efforts have made the same case. It is cheaper, it is more efficient, it is more predictable, and it delivers better outcomes for refugees and the states that receive them. We can do all of these things, but there has got to be a champion. And there has thus far not been a state or group of states willing to champion, not piecemeal global compact bit by bit all over the map, blah, 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 but a comprehensive package that actually retools, not the refugee convention, but the protection mechanism which implements that convention. And if we had the political will from a group of states to actually lead on that, I think we would be there. The sad truth is that we don't. And I don't believe UNHCR has provided appropriate leadership. The global compact was a farce. And I don't believe states have been honest. I think they have pretended to stand for responsibility when in fact, as in Europe, as in North America and elsewhere, They've done everything but seek to implement their obligations. And so it's a difficult road to hope. And I have taken the view that if you actually can just show states, as we can, if they were listening, if somebody was making the case that you could do more with less and do better, we might be able to bridge the political will gap. But that has yet to occur. Well, thank you very much. And, and you're making me feel very guilty for having asked a question which required a long response, as I can see that there are about another 30 questions still to be asked. Um, we're very close to the end of time. Uh, would you be prepared to extend for a few minutes and maybe take another two or three questions? I, I, I'm, I, I'm happy to do this as long as it's helpful to anyone, <laughs> but I don't want to interfere in the program. Um, well, maybe we'll just take another two or three. And thank you very much for your latitude on that point. So I have a question, in fact, two questions, but I'll take the first one. It's very easy for states to ratify, set up RSD systems, and then recognize very few refugees. What sort of supervisory system do you envisage that could deal with that kind of what, what the uh, intervener calls soft non-compliance? And that's from Catherine Costello. Yeah, it's a great question, as one would expect from Catherine. And so I I like the, the idea of soft non-compliance. Again, I'm getting nervous about this. It's, it, it's either compliant or it's not, right? Like, uh, I mean, there are cases that are fall in the gray zone, which I presume is what Catherine is referring to. But honestly, in most cases, there are answers. Uh, it is not, you know, sort of difficult to understand whether something is or isn't a breach in refugee law any more than it is in other areas of the law. So I guess what I'm suggesting is, that if we actually had a mechanism that could definitively resolve the question of whether, for example, this breaches the duty not to penalize refugees for unlawful entry, we would have a stronger position from which to work both in our formal advocacy before courts and in the kind of Brian Gorlick-esque civil society interventions that we make. We don't have that right now. I mean, UNHCR says this, the European Commission says that, two courts say this, Nobody knows what the answer is, uh, uh, except that it's in Catherine's books or my books, I guess. But you know, seriously, that is the problem. And I really think that we need clarity on that point before we can advance. So even an advisory opinion mechanism of the kind the Cambridge mechanism uh, proposed a decade ago 
would be a great start. It may not be where we need to end up, but we can at least begin to have normative clarity on some of these difficult issues that states seem unwilling actually to tackle. Many thanks. Um, the penultimate question is uh, quite closely related, and it's would you, sorry, do you consider that part of the problem around uh, the convention is the omission from the convention of a determination procedure, i.e. the way in which claims should be determined? And if so, what's the best solution for that gap? I, 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 you know, I'm open to thinking about that. I haven't thought about that a lot. I mean, the truth is, I'm not sure that, you know, if this is going to be a series of systems run within nation states. The idea of doing that is, is, is just not practically viable. We've got different legal systems with different procedural norms, and I'm not sure what that would look like. In the alternative model that I've proposed, I actually would have the International Supervisory Agency with effectively an army of decision makers that could be deployed around the world that would be applying common international norms in making the decisions for states. And by the way, they, I think states would be happy with that because a decision on refugee status under the model I proposed would not mean that that person would actually get to stay in that state. It would mean that she or he was entitled to protection under the responsibility sharing system somewhere. And if you disaggregate the expectation of permanency from the refugee procedure itself, I think we are able to move toward a more internationalized model that would do more justice to the integrity of claims than the episodic you know, non-compliance that we now see in many cases when different judges in different jurisdictions do different things. Thanks very much. And I should have added that that question was from Grecia Piaca Burga in uh, Peru. Um, for the last question, I'm going to take two very related ones, and I think they're nice ones on which to end. Um, the questions are, firstly, does the, quotes living instrument approach prevent regressive developments based on state practice? And relatedly, how do we as academics, practitioners, I suppose, as well, best support the ongoing interpretation of the convention? And that's from Thomas Gamotoft Hansen. Ah, uh, Thomas, you've given me a nice one. I mean, it's happy to end on a happy idea. And, and this is a great thing for us uh, because we should be thinking about what we can do. I don't think the living instrument theory prevents retrogression. I think it is an obstacle to retrogression. It is an argument that can be made. And as you saw from some of the screens I put up earlier, courts have been persuaded by the living instrument theory and included that in their interpretation of the definition. And that's how we got the human rights theory of being persecuted. That's how we got definitions of social group that included queer people and women and others, right? That's, 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 that's the critical way forward. Uh, and, and, and so I think our job, Thomas, is to, with integrity, and again, I really want to insist on this, I, I don't think we do anybody a favor by making claims that are not truly legally solid. They at least have to be solidly arguable. And by doing the kind of hard work of thinking about the reasons that states say no, of thinking about the rights that aren't respected, and framing an analytical paradigm that enables well-intentioned decision makers to get to yes, I think that's what we can do in the interim. I, I, I think that is our responsibility in the interim. Yes, we need to push for a supervisory mechanism. Yes, we need a mechanism for burden and responsibility sharing. But in the interim, we need to make a little bit like you know those cars in Cuba, the rusty old cars that they somehow just keep tuned up and they keep working. We need to tune up what is sadly a rustier vehicle than I would like it to be. Even as we wait for the new parts to come in, the new tires to come in, which are the big projects that I've talked about. Well, Professor Hathaway, that's a, a really fantastic place on which to leave the questions. I'm going to apologize to the 30 odd interveners who've added additional questions and there's some very probing ones in there. But I will say that reading through the comments, uh, most of them start with terrific presentation, fantastic presentation. And I'd just like to echo uh, those comments from the other interveners and say how brilliant it's been to have you here giving us your views in this keynote presentation to really set the tone for the conference as a whole, really get us thinking about what the convention is, what it's been and where it goes. So 
Thanks ever so much, Professor Hathaway, for joining us and for being so responsive in a kind of quick fire round of questions to the many different issues that other interveners raised. It's been a real pleasure to have you here. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity and thank you all again for bearing with us. Uh, I really respect everything that's happening in this conference and I look forward to listening in on some of the conversations to come. Fantastic. And for everybody else, including um, Professor Hathaway and other participants, we start up again tomorrow with a UK time morning session. So bright and early nine o'clock in the morning, which is probably something like midnight where you are, uh, Jim. But um, please do join us then. We've got some really fantastic panels tomorrow morning. And of course, the second keynote speaker will be Professor B.S. Chimney towards the end of the afternoon. So do join us then. In the meantime, I wish you all um, a very good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you might be, and we'll look forward to continuing the discussions tomorrow. Thanks, everybody, for your interventions, and of course, especially Professor Hathaway for taking so many questions and giving us such a really solid presentation from which to depart in some of the other discussions. So, good night, good morning, good afternoon, everyone.